Hello. Welcome back. Hey, everybody over in the chat. Great to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. And welcome to all the members who are there in the chat, too. Really good to see all of you. I'm Natalie, and this is Scientology Life After a Cult, where you'll catch me in the mornings doing recaps about the news that has the internet buzzing when it comes to Scientology. And let me tell you, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. And I talk about my 35 years in Scientology and how I left with three generations of my family. Another thing I do, which I absolutely love doing, are interviews with people in the community of ex-Scientologists, people who are protest protesting Scientology, pretty much anybody with connections to this whole thing. And tonight is no exception. Before I tell you about my guests, I just wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping here. If you are watching this on March 13th, Tomorrow the 14th, we're going to do the recap at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. We usually do it at 8 a.m., but tomorrow I have to do it at 8.30 a.m. and might even be a couple minutes late because I'm going to be running in from another meeting. So just wanted to put that out there. I already did a notification and that new time is noted. So again, if you're watching on March 13th, know that for tomorrow. Now, my guest this evening, we're going to be talking about the secret Scientology underground vaults, which I heard about when I was a Scientologist and no surprise was hit up for money to help pay for it. This is something that the average Scientologist does not know a ton about beyond being told that these secret vaults exist and a little bit about what goes in them. And we are going to be able to talk to someone who helped to build these vaults and knows the tea, knows who has seen them, who would be allowed to, because my big question is, has Tom Cruise been in the vaults? He gets all this special treatment because he's David Miscavige's BFF, but did he get to go in the secret Scientology vault? I don't know. We're going to find out. So I would like to welcome to the main stage here, Dylan Gill. Hey, Hooray. thanks Hip for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. That Many still makes you. me cringe. <laughs> I know, right? I, you know what? I think I'm finally <clears throat> over it. Like now. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, because it's at the beginning of every <laughs> single thing I do. And then we say it. So many people on my channel have almost made it, well, have made it a meme. So a lot of times that's what they'll comment when they're excited about something. Hip, hip, hooray. And right. my Australian friend said that that's a thing there. Like they do that as part of just the norm. Wow. That's crazy. I know. I don't, I only remember it at, um, course room, like at course time, um, yeah. if somebody had a win or something and then of course musters and that kind of thing. Yeah. Anytime you had to acknowledge L1 Hubbard at an event, lot of it going on at an event. That's why I want to take it back. All my, there's many things in Scientology that I've been working on. Take it back. <laughs> and that's one of them. I'm taking right. back. Hooray. You're not going to ruin it for me, Scientology. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing to take back. Yeah. So. yeah. Now, Dylan, a lot of people know you as Blow Drill here on YouTube. Right. And uh, in the chat, I think a, a ton of people know who you are. And some might not know, many might not know over on my channel that you have this fascinating history in the sea organization in that you were at what's considered to be the highest levels in Scientology working on these secret underground vaults. Right. Yeah, no, we, um, there was a man up mission done to populate the church of spiritual technology. And I was scooped up during the second phase of that. Yeah. So let's kind of, let's fill people in the church of spiritual technology. Can you explain a little bit about how that relates to Scientology? Is it run by the C organization, et cetera? Yeah, sure. Um, so during the reorg, when, when David Miscavige took over, um, like right around the prior to the LRH death event, um, Scientology was kind of going through a big reorg due to Larry Wollersheim. Um, and a few other big cases like that. Yeah. Um, so part of the corporate reorg, there's actually a policy called, called corporate reorg or corporate structuring. Um, and it talks about making an umbrella. So they splintered off all their corporation. That's where we got wise, able, um, applied scholastics, way to happiness, 
Um, and then we, that's how we got all the continental liaison offices and, and basically all that whole new corporate structure under CSI, which is church of Scientology international. And then, um, even at the same time, right around that time, like 82, 83, um, the watchdog committee issues came out. Mm. Um, and, and the reason why that's kind of important is it's a, it's a very distinct parallel to how CST was presented. So. You know how a lot of people are like, well, Mike Rinder was WDC OSA. Yeah. Like, that's not even an org. Like, WDC. The Watchdog Committee. Yeah, that's not even a, it's not even a thing. It's just a name. WDC is in, in name only. Yeah. His post would have been OSA Programs Ops CMO Inc. Hmm. So he would have always been in the CMO Inc. echelon as that's the side of, so that goes up, um, which is like all the management. So CST, when that was formulated, it was formulated around the same time RTC was formulated. And um, it was started as a garrison mission, which is a mission that's fired out of um, Action Bureau in one of the um, management organizations. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a long-term mission. It doesn't have a foreseeable future. It has um, targets that you continually check off, basically. So that's sure. how kind of CST was started corporately um the way that it was started in the sea org and and disseminated to public scientologists was um they created a fictitious name called lrh archives yes and, and that i was familiar with right right and so that was disseminated um right around the like do you remember when the ship project kind of started becoming like a mumble and a you know, yeah, like every wins and they, when they were recruiting. Right, right. It, before it was the ship project, and then it became the free wins before mm -hmm. while they were doing all that. So it was kind of like a little rollout. Um, and so LRH Archives was the same time. And that was all done through um, the corporate entity that is for profit called Author Services International. Yeah. And, and they basically raised, um, you probably remember the leather Dianetics books that yes. came out that were gold. Those were Special all editions, right? They were sold for LRH archives. That's so right. that was how Great public was that project. Right. Exactly. And then a lot of the writers of the future stuff and the science fiction, um, artwork was all auctioned off and were supposed to go towards LRH archives as well. So that was, it's like public reaching arm kind of thing. And so yeah, that's how they kind of set up CSD. So CST being the Church of Spiritual Technology, are you familiar with, if, if, was there any reason for that name, why it sounds like this separate entity from Scientology? Was there a reason why it needed to be named that for any public front-facing front, front facing reason? Um, not particularly other than um, LRH wanted, he, he had a bunch of advices about cst and archiving and you know the formulation of asi cst um as far as i know there were never any advices on rtc and that whole formulation but sure. and, CST, and yeah i just want to catch people up a little bit in case they don't know author services is what asi is because it's author mm -hmm. services incorporated or Inter Internet. yeah incorporated or yeah yeah and CSI is the Church of Spiritual Technology, and that's where Dylan worked. And they were tasked with archiving L. Ron Hubbard's materials so that they would withstand the coming apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, and it was pretty much like a thousand years was the goal. Like you wanted to have verifiable um, archival processes that would last that long, including the, the construction of the facilities that would house them. You know, so even at the time, um, there was uh, the first vault that was built was in New Mexico, and that mm -hmm. was done into the side of a mountain. So it was done that if, if people start sleuthing a little bit, there's a few New Mexico articles about when they invited um, our port captain who's in charge of the public relations named Jane McNairn. Um, she hosted the, sh I think it was the mayor and the sheriff of the local town to next to Trementina. And because there had been an incident <laughs> um, prior to me getting there, but right kind of concurrently with me getting there, um, what was the where one of the, the incident was basically 
when they got the New Mexico property, they were creating a lot of pat like roads that hadn't been there because they were cutting out um, the the where the vault was going to go, um, the landing strip, um, and then like the caretaker home. They're all in different parts and and where the LRH house was going to go. So it backs up to BLM land, and mm -hmm. they cut a road across BLM land. Well, the Bureau of Land Management sent a couple guys out, and the CST people <laughs> met them with guns. So, and what? and the shore story. <laughs> so, so well, the and, Sea Org members, because they are Sea Org members. Yes, they are right? Sea Org members. Yes, yeah. So you're saying because the Church of Spiritual Technology (CST), which mm -hmm. is a Sea organization organization, was building all this, they put a road right across BLM land. And so, yeah, kind of kitty corner. It was just like about a mile, but it like definitely cut across BLM land. <laughs> there was no doubt about it. Which you're not uh, supposed to do. No, that's yeah. You, I think you can if you get approval, but it, like after, you know, it's like kind of, it's that whole Scientology thing. You ask for permission afterwards. <laughs> yeah, like they've been violating their permits all over the place at these right. openings. So right, the authorities exactly. they show up to be like, hey, what are you guys doing with this road? And you're saying Sea Org members met them with guns. Well, they carried guns in the truck and because there was ra it's it was pretty much un um developed so it was pretty wild land, and it's out in the middle of nowhere so there's you know more wildlife than people um so yeah. it wasn't uncommon to have you know some kind of device to protect yourself sure. um but they we at the time it was we had a shore story because we we hadn't had tax exemption yet so um we were like oh no we just preserve religious materials and documents and you know, it was, we were very, we were supposed to be very vague in all aspects of every vase or base about what our actual, per, which is a standard data series. You know, you, you generate a shore story basically. Yeah. Which is and, a lie, but it's Scientology speak. <laughs> right. It's a, yeah, it's a Scientology lie. So it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That's totally fine. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah. What that was the happening with the road and all that. So they, instead of like de-escalating, the the CST staff kept, left made that left left them with more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. So they promptly went and investigated, figured out it was Scientology, figured out it was the Church of Spiritual Technology. This whole big kerfuffle kind of happened. Yeah. Um. We got people from our end, RPF. They were sent down to Int. For cleanup um and it was sort of gloss i mean it was sort of fixed yeah. um because there was no there was no weird like we weren't doing anything that we weren't supposed to be other than violating private proper or bureau of land management property so um, wow so it was kind of a you know it was a contentious and everywhere like it was it's if you look at scientology's history it's exactly how they moved into florida that's true. Secret. Right? It's the same. It's so their MO never changes. Yeah, they <laughs> were out there changed. with guns. Right. Well, and they came in under the United Churches of Florida and yeah. like, hey, we want to buy this church, you know, this this hotel. And it's like, surprise, we're Scientology. And it's and that was the whole, it's all premeditated. Like that's the whole idea behind it is that nothing Scientology does is haphazard. It's all based on policy. And it's all carefully orchestrated. It's all carefully investigated and orders are done like orders to the T like fly yourself to this place, check into this place, do the Like it's they, that's how they run things. So, yeah. So know, when everything's. You were, yeah. Sorry. The, okay. So was the first, the first one you're saying was in New Mexico. That was the first vault that was built. That was um, built. the, the main base was always up at um lake arrowhead or the surrounding towns are basically crestline rim forest um twin peaks and lake arrowhead is actually further away closer to big bear yeah. but because that's the main and that was one of the things even being staff up there is you referred to the base by different names to different people hmm. so it Be was you're in scientology or not in scientology uh, well, we didn't really deal at CST. We didn't deal with anybody like anybody we dealt with, with in Scientology was either like author services or int. 
Mm. So, and none of them knew. So we had to be very careful when we went to Int. Um, like we couldn't tell them, hey, I'll be there in two hours. Also, you know, we, even people at yeah, the was, confidential international Hemet base where everybody but Scientologists knew where it was, that where where international management was considered to be, right. was going, they could not even know where you were. There were people at CST that didn't know where the external bases were. You mean, like, so there were people at this, this church of spiritual technology run by the Sea Org, mm -hmm. you're saying, who yeah. didn't know where these secret underground vaults were? The other ones besides the main base, yeah. Besides their own know. one. So they would know if you're in mm -hmm. New Mexico, you're like, okay, I'm in New Mexico at the secret Scientology underground base. <laughs> yeah, you never said that. You well, Only certain people would leave the main base to yeah. go to external bases, and you never were like, Hey, I'm heading to New Mexico. <laughs> you know, like you, wouldn't do that. <laughs> you were just like, that's not happening. <laughs> so tell me, tell me this. I'm so curious about. So there's this plan because L. Ron Hubbard at some point said, Hey, you better like preserve all my stuff because if there's like an apocalypse, people are going to need Scientology to restart society. Was that kind of the feel? Absolutely. It was, um, and it was also the, um, not to get off on a, on a tangent, but it's kind of the Gnostic idea that like LRH, the way his history came about, the only way that he could truly fulfill his quote unquote, whatever dream or, or vision is <laughs> to become a kind of a deity himself. And, and the only way to do that is to preserve your name and your works for all eternity. Wow. So in the end that, and that's kind of, that even plays into why there was never supposed to be another leader in Scientology. It, the org board wasn't set up for that. Um, it had to be completely reorganized in order to accommodate an actual leader or, you know, one that oversees all the chairman yeah. of boards, but, yeah. um, what David, other than that, right, right, right. And, and so it's like, even now where people are, it's become so like our short term memory of like, well, who's going to take over after DM? Well, nobody, because nobody was ever supposed to take over for LRH. <laughs> like, yeah, that was true. the, you know, unless there's a, a maniacal psychopathic narcissist in the wings waiting to take over for DM, and then it'll probably repeat itself. How did they figure out, because these are C organization members, and it would take, you'd have to know something about technology of preservation on what kind of material, do, who did the research? How did, there had to have been external help at some point to to maybe not create and dig out the vault. I don't know. I mean, kind of kind of walk me through it. Who well, was advising on that? So that's what's funny. Because um, there wasn't the internet. <laughs> no, and, and um, even at the time, like we knew what, it was basically taking a project and saying, here's your goal and then working backwards from that. And so uh, it, uh, unfortunately, a lot of this is covered in the on the Scientology website about the preservation, and it's actually very well put together videos. Um, not that I'm saying anybody should go there. If you do use a VPN or, or do whatever you need to do, um, yeah. but it's actually quite interesting. And I, even on my channel, I have a few shorts that go over, I snipped, I might, I might or might not have snipped some of their <laughs> footage um <laughs> so um and i have no intention of monetizing so they can take it and do whatever they want with it honestly <laughs> so um but yeah the, the so the process basically went that we're going to need to archive um on plates and we're going to need to archive on paper and we're going so they went and found the the most archival paper that is around and then they tried to improve on it and so that was outsourcing the most popular paper where people were putting really important documents that they needed to last a thousand years. Right. Well, and subsequently with, when you have a lot of money and, a, and an intention behind you, like they created a lot of patents, they created a lot of, um, almost like, even when we built the, the underground storage facilities, we were using cutting edge technology at the time to create very strong, but lightweight concrete. You know, because we needed to stack our um, in our corrugated tubes, we had to have so much. We wanted them to move in case there was a flood or in case there was earthquakes. And you you know, certain concrete it gets. Um, you you play with that brittle strength weight kind.
kind of ratio. So we were using fiberglass sh shards and our concrete, um, you know, and we were doing just like over the top stuff at the time. Yeah. Um, and that was part of it because um, we were archiving forever. We were, we were preserving the technology. So we were making it go right on a completely different level. Wow. You know? <laughs> No so, kidding. So yeah. what about then like, to, let's talk about, cause I've heard a lot about these titanium discs. In fact, when, uh, when I was in Scientology, my husband at the time and I went to author services there in Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard and went right. through the whole song and dance. Well, if you buy this battlefield earth print, that's worth nothing for $3,000 or whatever, <laughs> right. the right. money goes towards preserving the tech preserving right. L. Ron Hubbard's tech. And we were told a little bit about just that it was these underground vaults. They didn't say where it was. So where did it come into play where it was like, okay, the best, the thing that's going to last a thousand years is doing it on these titanium discs and then the machine, whatever it was to then play them. Isn't that there as well? Wasn't that part of it? Yeah. They made a uh, record player that um, works on a few different medias. You can use it as a hand crank, solar. Um, there's a few different, and plug it in as well. Um, there's also Nakamichi Dragons, which are, you know, per policy. Um, wait, 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 so the, um, tape decks, like dual, like LRH oh, talked about, yeah. yeah, like in every course room in Scientology yeah. are Nakamichi Dragons. That's the brand. Know they called, maybe that's how the rumor about Scientology having dragons got started. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, maybe because yeah. he writes about it. He It's like the rainbow vacuum, right? Like the approved vacuum to use in LRH spaces is the rainbow vacuum. Does and that so sense? like, absolutely. Yeah, you can still buy them. They're like so expensive. They're like a little bit better than Kirby kind of thing. I think they're like four grand. A wow. Piece. It's crazy. like military kind of stuff. Um, Yes, but, Steve is saying it's high end Japanese audio. That's right. That's right, yeah. Smooth Steve. Super well, high, end. Super <laughs> high end. For the 1970s and 80s, at least. Yeah. So it was but, determined that that would be the way to go. And you're saying that the record record players, well, I mean, I guess for lack of a better way of describing them, were solar plugged in or they could be crank. And were there actually titanium discs that Ellen Hubbard's like, lex I mean, what was on there? Was it um, just they were done in nickel. They weren't done in titanium. Okay. Um, the, the titanium was the, the containers that um, have the inert gas in them, like, which is argon. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, like, it depends what media you're talking about. So it wasn't just like, the, it's all his written, it's his voice, it's video. So there's all these different types of media that had to be preserved mm -hmm. and then had to have equipment to be able to utilize them and to disseminate them to whoever, um, what material? Yeah, whoever, whoever had a code for the locked vault that we won't talk about that part. <laughs> <laughs> um, what material, what materials of L. Ron Hubbard was the intention to every single lecture that he ever did every single book that he wrote was the intention to have all of those preserved onto these nickel nickel plates uh yeah every um hcopl hcob um every uh advice all the r d volumes which is research and discovery mm -hmm. um all the obviously auditing levels um ev everything that all his science fiction works um, I mean, that's, that's the part of immortalizing, isn't it? Like that's, yeah. but so the first part of archives was when it was started in like 82, 83, um, the first phase of the project was to go out and find every handwritten, every, um, anything that was original or like any masters. Yeah. And so that's, that was, that spanned over probably five years or six years. Of going like to all every these places. original of L. Ron Hubbard's work, every piece of original work right. he had. Okay. Right. And so by 89, um, we had almost everything and we're verifying all the things that like a lot of the lectures, we didn't have original masters. We had um, original copies mm -hmm. or we have, you know, like a three off kind of, we didn't have the original, but we had like the copy of the copy. Yeah. Kind of thing. So, and then a lot of them were so um, deteriorated that they actually had to um, invent 
machines to help repair them. And so, yeah, they went to a lot of, I mean, they spent a, it, their, the budget for CST was like ridiculous. It, because there was a pre preservation side and then there was the archival side. And, and the archival side was basically, I mean, you basically take a page out of the like Knights Templar, right? Yeah. Like their whole idea was to build, like bury stuff in secret vaults. Yeah. So it, it's the same basic idea. And that, you know, the whole, I, those whole ancient knowledge kind of plays through like science. It kind of explains where LRH's head was at when he yeah. started to con like connect the religion together. And even in the later years, how that psychosis kind of developed and, you know, became almost like a paranoia. Um, so. Wow. It's it, this, I mean, the magnitude of a project like this is absolutely incredible. Do you have any idea how far they actually got in doing this? Cause it's a um, lot. Of, that's a, I mean, L Ron Hubbard did a ton. I mean, wrote a lot and said a lot. Yeah. Well, that's the only job. That was our only job was to do that. So they got everything, like everything is pretty much in vaults um, and preserved as we see. levels. Absolutely. Yeah. We had, um, we had guys that were of, we, it was really, we had a guy that wanted to leave. And so this was like a shell. I've been, I've tried to explain this to a few people, but cause I've, I've had a narrative about Shelly for a long time, just cause I kind of been there and knew what the general, like way, the way that org works. Yeah. You're and, talking Shelly Miscavige. Uh huh. Okay. Um, is we had a guy that was our only OT, OT translator. So he was the only guy that could like copy um, any of the original LRH OT stuff onto archival paper and that now, kind of stuff. Let me ask you this. When you say copy onto archival paper, did they handwrite it? Was it typed? No, like copy. Like we, we got like archival copy machines oh, with archival no. ink. Yeah, and like that a, paper, like and yeah, like almost like like a Xerox, but way cooler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, was it all in English, or is it is it preserved in other languages? You know, that's a good question. I never even I assumed it was just English, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, so, but that, I would imagine um, that might be. Don't give don't give them any ideas to work those people more. Yeah, um, but when when they cop, so they're copying this over. All of the materials are pretty much on there because, like you said, that's all that these people were doing. And there's one guy who could do the upper levels, the the OT levels, because he had already done them. So he was the only one who could make the copies of the confidential materials. And you're right. saying you wanted to right. leave? Oh yeah. Um, so we would have to. Uh, we used to watch, like, so that gate, like, in, when people have seen pictures of CST, like, there's the main um, driveway and there's a little yeah. guard shack. Yeah. And so we used to man that all the time, like overnight. So there would always be somebody on watch duty. Um, and so when he was in ethics trouble and was reading, uh, basically he was like writing OWs, which is overts and withholds. Mm -hmm. And um, he was reading the um, axioms and maxims. So he had um, to read LRH materials and disclose his harmful acts that he was doing because he wanted to leave the Sea Org. And it was pretty much he wanted to just go back to Ant and be with his wife is is honestly what he really wanted. Oh, he didn't even um, want to leave the steward. He just wanted to leave the Church of Spirit. Yeah, he was just unhappy being there and being like, because the whole idea was CST was originally manned up for couples. Um, they wanted it to be primarily couples because of the end product of CST was to have caretaker couples at the base at the different bases. So ah, you would have remain behind and live there. Right. And main, excuse me, and maintain, um, or be able to swap each other out. So one couple could be at the main base and doing enhancement, um, better known as indoctrination. Um, <laughs> and you know, keep them in the fold while an, another couple goes out. So you, you would always have a caretaker taker couple, um, to just man the bases. And that was the whole complement of staff for every external base. Just two? Supposed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what so then what was your role? Um, I was the estate secretary or the division head over the estates, which is all the buildings. 
So I, um, my job was to maintain um, all the property, all the buildings and dwellings and structures, um, and to I was over all the new construction, mm -hmm. um, and then the external bases. Um, we had in CST we had a division three A, and which was our external division, mm -hmm. but it was like ghosted on the org board, so it wasn't there, but it was there, and um, yeah, wow. so that's what I was my job. Was. I was the division what head over that. What happened to the guy who wanted to go and be with his wife at the at the int base? Uh, he got handled. <laughs> that's, okay. that's what happens in Scientology is you get handled, yeah. right? Um, yeah, he just it, and eventually he became a you know he did his job and and went back to work. And so when I did the podcast with Mike and Leah, mm -hmm. um, they asked the same thing, and I was like, you know, honestly, once Shelley got through the conditions and they were approved, she would be put on a post and she would be producing. Yeah. So, like, and for, for people that don't know, can you kind of explain a bit about that? So they understand where it is that Shelly Miscavige is and how that's set up. Um, well, right now Shelly Miscavige is in Twin Peaks um, at the base that's right up above San Bernardino. And is that um, a base for the underground secret vaults? There is a vault there, but that is also the main base base where the production building is and where the um, almost entirety of CST staff are housed. There's only um, 19 CST staff total. Wow. So like everything. <laughs> there's no other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's not a lot. And there wasn't a lot. When I was there, there was between usually 16 and 19. Mm -hmm. there, there were never really more than that. And how um, many, how many of these bases are there? Uh, right now there are four. Um, there was supposed to be a fifth up in uh, Montana, but mm -hmm. they went there kind of same idea in the cover of darkness, started making a bunch of racket and all the locals were like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. And they pretty much said, no permits, you're shut down. And um, I just spoke to the lady who used her family used to own the property before um, CST bought it mm -hmm. and she wants to buy it back. <laughs> so, oh, but I don't think it's for sale. <laughs> Unfortunately, because her whole family, like she had like five generations that grew up there. So, wow. Um, so, so then Scientology just owns that property out in Montana and they're not doing anything with it then, likely. Right, right. Um, it's they don't do anything. So, the, the actual bases there are two in California one's in uh, Petrolia, one's at the Lady Washington Mine, which is in uh, Tuolumne County. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's one in New Mexico in Trementina, which is um, just a few hours southeast of um, uh, Taos or uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico. Yeah. And then the main base is up in uh, Lake Arrowhead. You said that when Shelly Miscavige finished her condition, she would have been put on a post. What did she have to do conditions for? And for those that don't know, conditions in Scientology are a series of steps that you need to do to in like raise your status with the group right um well so i didn't get the, that could you try again why is siri talking is that you what what did she have to do conditions for is that something that anybody coming in had to do no 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 absolutely not um just the way that uh she was put up at cst originally with her she had like three handlers basically um it was more of you know it, it's the idea of when you have somebody especially at cst so the way i was busted out of cst i was in new mexico right mm -hmm. so i was called back immediately to the main base i'm sure they were like pissing their pants if i have even thought that there was anything wrong because I would have all this opportunity to leave. Yeah. And we, and even when I was at CST, I mean, we can talk about it sometime, but like I would fly to New Mexico and drive a rental truck back, mm -hmm. stay at a hotel overnight, like yeah. have cash to a cat. They give me cash, Yeah, <laughs> you know? So I could have taken off and done whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. Um, yeah. So they give you cash to pay for the rent a car, cash to pay for a hotel. In the hotel, right. Exactly. And food or whatever to eat along the way. Um, Always cash though, not like here's a. Yeah, there's no corporate credit card. Um, 
and even getting cash was the typical Scientology FP, which is financial planning. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a pain in the ass. Like you have to sign everything out, sign it back in and do your accounting and all this crap. Yeah. And yeah, it's really, they're very, you know, it's projection, right? They're so anal and weird and about finances because they're so dishonest about finances. So yeah. it makes sense that they think everybody's going to rip them off because they rip everybody off. Yeah. So. so then what would, what would be, what do you think would be Shelly Miscavige's role then at the base? Cause she's not a couple. Maybe she is, I guess we don't know. Would right. she be a caretaker at one of these, at, at this base that has the vault? No. Um, in fact, the, uh, caretakers, um, are, I know who the caretakers are and it's not them. It's not her. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a, it's a couple. Um, and yeah. So if she was out there, um, like I said, she would have either probably gone out there to relieve them for them to come back and, you know, get up to date on everything, or, um, it would have been part of her job to go out mm -hmm. there, you know, to maybe inspect the vaults or maybe yeah. take inventory or, um, cause whether, you know, I, I know that it's like, oh, Shelly was, you know, like banished to this place. He was still Shelly Miscavige. Like there was only five people on the int base that dealt directly or really knew about CST for a long time. So and it was a five... secret project even from international management. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we it can do it in like the chat. Does anybody want to guess who the five people are? <laughs> <laughs> the five people. I can give you all clues. One of them is somebody that Serge Del Mar likes to talk about a lot. Um, or still two of there? them now. Um, you, one of them still there, yes. And Karen one of them is not still there. Huh? <laughs> Karen Bass? No, no. Angie Bank Blankenship? Angie Blankenship is one, yes. That's one. That's one. Um, one. Michael Rinder, Mike Sutton, DM, and Shelly. Is Michael Rinder related to Mike? R wait, wait, that all that were there then. Yes, he was one of the main people at that time that oh, would have knew. Not okay. Marty. Marty wouldn't have known. No. It was definitely Rinder, Blankenship, Sutter. Um, and then Shelly and DM were the people I dealt with DM and my, um, my ex-wife dealt with Shelly like all the time, like weekly, daily sometimes. So on the, that's, on and so her job, she would have come over more as Shelly Miscavige. She would have come over. And if she was, the reason why I say conditions is it was assumed that she had bypassed, let's say it was basic Scientology. No, none of this like sentimental husband and wife stuff, which that's yeah. just a consideration in science in the sea org that doesn't really in the end of the day you're not husband and wife it's it's just you're a body like yeah. you're not a body so you don't have that consideration yeah. um shelly would have come over because she had bypassed david miscavige on putting implementing the org board and oh, also right. moving their their birthing mm -hmm. to a, to another spot um and he got pissed off and then he banished her well, in I that's speculation because I don't know. I wasn't there, but I do know the policy and I know bypassing. I know the policy yeah. is basically what an executive wants on their lines mm -hmm. and um, they don't bypass is not one of them. So that would be an actionable offense for mm -hmm. HCL, not OSA, because OSA is not internal facing to the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. OSA is external facing for threats. Their only internal facing job is to find any kind of infiltrators or spies that's that's their only internal everything else that's internal is handled through the hubbard communications office got it got so, it um so yeah, i'm trying so, to picture this these how large would one of these vaults be were they pretty consistent in being similar in size yes and no they're about 300 yards um long mm -hmm. um but like the one up at Lake Arrowhead is about 200 and like 70, I think, or right around there. Okay. Um, but it's a little, so the, it, it was basically, um, you had a square footage that you had to fit and it was whether we would stack it or stack it side, like two sure, sure. or one long one. Yeah. <laughs> so we did one long one in Trementina, one long one in Petrolia, um, two in lake arrowhead kind of thing with the you know connecting tunnels kind of thing yeah 
So then when you're, when all the materials are in there, like you have, you were saying there's archival paper that was used that all of LRH's writings were put on and there were nickel discs for the lectures and the, and the, were the videos on the nickel discs as well? No, they were archived through. And so some stuff could last a lot longer than others. And that's why it was sort of redundant. Yeah. Right. So you could put a translation of a lecture on a plate that will last like a, a stainless steel plate that will last a thousand years. Yeah. You can also do put reel to reel, but that's only going to have a shelf life of like three to 500 years, but yeah. you can seal it and put argon. And, and so that if you archive it and preserve it, chances are that when it hits the, the atmosphere again, it's not just going to disintegrate. It'll actually have some integrity. Got it. Um, How did the so that, members learn to archive these items? Um, there's a thing inside the Sea Org called Radidi. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? That's how they learn? It stands for read it, drill it, do, do it. it. <laughs> and um, the other thing is um, what is greatness? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I always have said, and I, when I was at Flag, um, I've kind of had like three different Sea Org careers. I, I, I started out at Flag. And then I went to LA and then I went up to CST. Yeah. Um, and I was only supposed to go to LA to get my clearances to go up to CST, but sometimes, you know, Scientology is kind of a crazy place. Um, so I ended up doing a crap load of missions at, in LA under a lot of the international people. Yeah. You um, came to get a mission at my organization I did. When yes. I was adding, we figured out that's when I was in the sea organization in the estates or, yeah. and you came rolling up in there and sent the commanding officer to the rehabilitation project force. Right. Yeah, or we did. We did a sit handling mission into yeah. your org and uh, RPF to the commanding officer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I remember was, that. I want to say I was like almost 16. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I was 16, 17. Yeah. Right. Then I got in 17 then <laughs> right no so it was pretty crazy um yeah no nuts um when you look back at that it, it's it's crazy being a part of that so young yeah. and then as you like mature mm -hmm. you start seeing or i guess you don't you start seeing some of the cracks and you start seeing a lot of the inconsistencies and you start seeing how the policy um contradicts itself yeah, completely. and so you sort of, if you allow yourself to even catch a wind of or or like follow some of those threads, because even LRH said, um, one out point is enough to have an to to do an evaluation or an mm -hmm. investigation, just one. Yeah. So when you start seeing out points in the Sea Org, you're like, holy shit! Yeah. You know, like this, we need to do an investigation and figure out what, like, where's the out ethics? Where's the SP? Where's the and it's like, no, 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 we don't do it over in this part. <laughs> like, oh, wait, wait, what? Well, yeah. that's an out point. <laughs> and that should be invest. It's like you train some people too well and then they un like kind of unscrew themselves. They you know? brainwash themselves. <laughs> right. and, and I think it wouldn't have happened unless I went to a place like CST. Yeah. Um, because then that. Kind of a, like, I mean, as far as jobs in the Sea Org go, I've heard that CST was kind of like working up there was not, not like it was working at other organizations. Is that true? Um, yes. Yeah. And no, I mean, it was a true estates org. So you would have a lot more understanding um, of how it ran than a lot of people because a lot of people were in service orgs yeah. or management orgs. And I came from um, middle management, like the basic, observation and execution arm like you know how chris shelton likes to say he was in the continental liaison office mm -hmm. i was in the the organization that watched those guys yeah <laughs> right so it was like um that was more management it, like i call it dunder mifflin the continental liaison office because that's where that's right. where i ended up leaving from <laughs> that place was so awful um and you were there when it was in um at big blue right yeah it was in the blue buildings yeah yeah <sighs> I remember yeah. that hallway. I hated the, I can still smell it. I can smell that hallway. 
<laughs> those little offices on the and you, you know you never realized that these were this was a those were like patient rooms like you, that was like a post-op or something <laughs> that's what and it was crazy to think and all these file cabinets and all these people doing yeah it was but i always saw that from a level of like going into it with um my job title for my almost entire CEO career was being the observation and execution arm for watchdog committee and CMO international. Mm -hmm. So it was like this big responsibility of like, we were challenged with acting and being little LRHs all day, every day. Oh my God. That was our job. We Chinese schooled it. You know, what is being said or done to me is being said or done to the Commodore. You know, mm -hmm. anything in the course of action of my duties, you know, that's, it, it's just, it's crazy yeah, to think see, about, you know. You mean you would, you would, so in, in Scientology and in the Sea Org, for those that don't know, Chinese school is when they would repeat things back. So somebody would read off, uh, you know, uh, something <laughs> and everybody right. would just yell it back. So you guys would do that with your like, things that related to so your the, job. Right. And no, no, no. So the MAA, so in the, in different orgs, this was, this is something that's a weird nuance is in the CMOs, in the continental units, we would do Chinese school every day at lunch muster yeah. every day yeah. and with our, with our master at arms, with his swagger stick pointing the way, <laughs> mm -hmm. what is greatness? And everybody's like, what is greatness? And then you go, and then at the end, we're like, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and then we go run off and do our little jobs. For the next 120 hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, just so I kind of have a clear picture of this, then with these vaults, <laughs> the materials would they were archived, so they were they were they were preserved in ways you were saying with like argon gas. Is that what it's called? Right. Yes, it's an inert gas, basically that doesn't allow oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then they're put into just some type of container and just all sat set in these vaults or are they just kind of stacked up and labeled what does it look like when you go in they're um they're absolutely they're <laughs> they're like it's almost like a baker's rack mm, mm -hmm. right so if anybody's done any baking or anything like that like a proofing rack where you'd proof everything um it's the same idea so once we made the time capsules which were made in taiwan by the way at the same time they were making the mark 8 e-meter mm -hmm. which was kind of funny um because the our our deputy commanding officer for external and our commanding officer were doing all the research for David Miscavige on the Mark Eights at the same time as that we were doing the time capsules. Wow! And so, so that's we, what they were called was were time capsules. Uh huh. With the material yeah. in there, were they super fancy? The, it sounds like <laughs> yeah. it was there. Like, did anybody put in a letter? Like, if you find this. Here's what it was, and here's what it is. Was there anything that explained what it was? Because what if the apocalypse did happen, and the people that are left, or who knows how much time goes by, and someone shows up? There's a routing <laughs> form, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Step right? one. Step one. Right. On the Go to see the registrar. Yeah, <laughs> Buy exactly. your book. Right. Leave any whatever money monetary, whatever monetary there is now. Use that to pay for everything. That's right. Five thousand um, dollars equals two goats. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So there'd be a bunch of goats sitting by the vault. Um, no, well, there's and that's one thing that like so we were very compartmentalized. Like my job primarily was to build the underground storage facility, the buildings that would you would actually archive every you'd put everything in the titanium capsules and put the gas in, and then those would be basically stuck on a rack. And then those would be transported into the vault and then a blanket, a fireproof, you know, to, I think it's like 5,000 degrees or 3,000 degrees blankets put over it with a little CST logo and it's all super fancy. Um, but, you know, that we never, when we were briefed about like that, that part of the archival process, they were never like, to me, it would make sense that there'd be like, you know, number one open this one first but it's yeah. like what would stop people from um opening like the ot levels and yeah. first or whatever so there were when we designed the vaults and this is all from deduction it, it was no briefing um is we had a few areas that would have another door 
So one of them I know for sure was for personal effects because that was only in one vault. What do you mean personal um, effects? Um, well, so from the time, and this can be verified through like watching like Janice and, and a bunch of her, um, which is amazing the peeling the, like her stories, um, yeah. give Science a really TV. good history and chronological order of everything that happened like prior to, um, landfall basically to flag. And, and so even at that point, LRH was, um, he like he was fond of collecting like rare gems and and different jewels and and things like that and so those always had to be um basically accounted for inventory right so these rare gems and jewels of elron hubbard are also kept in these vaults i would you know we were never briefed directly but i know for sure there was a spot for all this because all his lrh houses were also set up with his like personal stuff staff area like and so it was sort of um implied that these other areas that and again the way they did it like so when i is a good example is when i first got to cst i was expediting which is what mo most new staff goes to, to the personnel office and then you expedite mm -hmm. and then they figure out where they're going to put you so they figured out where they're going to put me they they put me on post as the estate sec and i started doing my job so for about six months I'm doing my jobs. And then one day the, the commanding officer brings me in and tells me all about the external sites. And before that, I had no idea. Yeah. Um, so there's a compartmentalization, mm -hmm. right? And he was like, nobody else knows. The only people that know about this are the exec structure. Don't tell, you know, the rig. And that's, you just learned even being where I came from, you learn not to just have that kind of small talk. It was just like, not smart. Yeah. Somebody will be like, great. And then they'll turn around, write a KR and out security is a bad, bad in the Sea Org. Yeah. That's RPFable immediately. So mm -hmm. um, you just learn to kind of not do that. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Lord of the Flies kind of thing. You preserved yourself as much as you could. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So there was an LRH home at every, or is at every one of these bases that has an underground vault. Um, no, not a vault in the, but the vaults. So the whole base has an LRH house, a caretaker house and an underground storage facility. So in those underground storage facilities, there's, um, your, like your entrance and all what you would see all the archival stuff, but then there's also another vault door. Um, and so I had hypothesized that that would be for OT levels possibly uh, yeah, and personal effects. Cause there was also another room for for that but there's only one um that has three and that's it in new mexico so if he was going to have his stuff somewhere that's where he would have that but then that also would have to be inventory so yeah and so um, each of these homes for lrh would have everything that he would need so the, here's something that always confused me because you know in the sea org we were always told right we come back you sign a billion year contract, you come back again and again, working for Scientology in the Sea Org for free. Mm -hmm. But then it was also said, well, Elron Hubbard went off to Target too, and he could not right. do any more research with a physical body. So he had to discard it. That was a short story told to all right. Scientologists that he causatively dropped the body. And, you know, you leave Scientology and find out immediately that's not true. <laughs> Were you in LA when that happened? 86. Yeah. I was in Hawaii yeah. and then oh, you're I in Hawaii. So, okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. So. Um, yeah. I was at flag when that happened. Mm -hmm. And so we were, um, we were reality factored in no uncertain terms that we were not to show grief or emotion. Yeah. We were supposed to go to the event and then go right back to post and produce. Um, and that was kind of our, and then what's weird is right after that, like within a couple of days, the loyal officer issues showed up everywhere. Oh, that's right. About Pat and any broker being right next in line to take over and run Scientology. Right. So that was the only crack that any internal Sea Org people saw of this internal struggle. Yeah. When David the the Savage took over and got rid of them. Right. Which is pretty, you know, that, that in itself is an interesting, the way that kind of happened, 
mm-hmm. is is pretty interesting um but that was a sign for where i was at the time you know i didn't realize it until later but i was like wow that was an internal struggle because so that issue basically said that Pat and any broker were promoted to the rank of loyal officers and LRH was no longer the Commodore and was now the Admiral. Mm. And so he was going off and he was going to go off to target two. And, and that was kind of the whole, and then that got taken down, um, with a, with a swift correction. And then at his coup. Right. Well, and it was kind of happening during that is, Mm -hmm. is kind of, you know, it was like who could get off the first volley kind of thing. And, yeah. you know, that's when he was going. That's when he put um, Janice's sister on post, I believe, and took over because um, he was at the, he was in the special unit at the time. Um, and then that's a whole nother. I mean, you can get that's that's a big rabbit hole. I love going down. I have a ton of research on it, but it needs its own little. Yeah, we'll, um, the, we'll do another yeah. video <laughs> that something. rabbit hole. But you were saying then with where were we at the with the vaults because I was trying to picture in my mind like how these look and what's in there and how what the plan was what if and when somebody discovered these things and each of these bases has a house for L. Ron Hubbard. It were are the, each of the houses on the different bases the same? I mean, are they like and how big are these? No, absolutely. Homes for L. Ron Hubbard. How many bedrooms? There, do you have? They're around um 35 to 3,700 square feet. Um, oh, that's like big. One, yeah, it's a big, like, multi-level house. The one on Lake Arrowhead is basically set up for LRH to come back and um, his whole support staff to be able to work there. And there's another cabin on the main base for all the international execs in case he needed them. So there was, like, I know a lot of people are like, oh, is was there LRH coming back or not? At CST... LRH was coming back 100%. No, I, I honestly would glance over at the gate all the time, expecting some little redheaded kid to be running up. Like kind of, yeah. it's weird. Cause when I had a kid, he was redheaded and I, I was like, <laughs> and I was redheaded when I, like, it was a trip. Like it was, you know, there's a lot of layers to this trauma that, um, that present themselves in very odd ways. So um, with this house though, this, these 3,500 square foot, homes for l ron hubbard at these different bases were they fully furnished <laughs> like, absolutely yeah no they were pretty much la- well, like turnkey would like, they update them i mean you were there for eight years or so so maybe you wouldn't know but because how things looked and we're talking about in the 80s right 80s early yeah, 90s. 80s to early yeah exactly um it was all like pretty much cutting edge stuff would it be updated by now maybe um depending on what the i you know are the there one thing cabinets in the kitchen <laughs> right no uh, i mean it was all high end it, it was all custom you know everything was done um with kind of spare notes but same way in, in gold were kind of built yeah you know like that like the rtc building that has like 15 people in it that could house like a thousand you know <laughs> it's like it's it's built over the top like even um when i was out and not that long ago, like a few few years back, I, I went, I was in Denver and I went into the Denver org and um, they gave me a tour and all this. And um, they showed me the sauna and they were just, all they could do, it was so weird. Cause like growing up in it and having my, my father in it, my grandfather in it, you know, you have all these principles just like ingrained in your head. Mm -hmm. and they were all they were doing was like hopping up this mess like this matter energy space and time right like they were just being like this wood is zebra wood from south africa and the and i'm just like wow like this is completely different than what i grew up like this isn't this is completely like morphed and and not that what i grew up was not snake oil and yeah um it wasn't as much about the stuff it wasn't right. as, <laughs> yeah, exactly you know, the Joneses. That's why I was wondering about those those homes and the setups. Does does someone go in and someone must clean or dust or maintain it? Do they do they run the pipes? I guess it doesn't get freezing there's, cold. There's a stat in estates, yeah. and it's called square paces, and um, so that stat is basically number of square paces that are clean. Like if it has a piece of paper on it, it doesn't pass. So yes, there was, that was my stat. 
<laughs> my stat was number of square paces. So yeah, we had to make sure all the spaces were clean and upkept. That's why, you know, clean ship project is a big deal for people in the States because that's, yeah. the, that's when everything gets clean. So, wow. So um, there's everything he would need. He could just walk in and these homes would have everything. There's towels, there's clothes. I always wondered, like, do they update the clothes? Are they putting clothes that was from back when? or And, and they wouldn't put them out daily or anything. I mean, like, yeah. I think some of that stuff would, you don't even know how old he would have, you know, like, and even yeah. hypothesizing yeah. that is kind of silly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I pitched, it's like, uh, what is it? Talladega Nights when he's like, little teeny infant baby Jesus. <laughs> yeah. and he's like, like, I kind of pictured him as like eight-year-old LRH or 12-year-old LRH, yeah. not like yeah. infant LRH or... But yeah, I, they didn't, I've never seen LRH clothes being put out daily. Not that not, I'm not saying anybody's a liar, but anywhere I was, I never saw people putting out his uniforms every not day. Putting them out, but where are you saying that the clothes are there though in the closet? No, no, there was no clothes or any, it was all, and then it's not like you wouldn't stock it with food. Like you weren't, it wasn't yeah. an eminent return or anything. <laughs> it was, it was like a, you know, like if you bought a brand new house that was furnished. Uh, wow this. and so the, and these they, they just sit there empty because no one's allowed to live there or stay there right well and that's where you look at the real intent um where you know all war is based on deception mm -hmm. right and and the one thing that we should always 100 percent assume about david miscavige and anybody associated with him is everything he's doing is war to him and so everything is based on deception. So part of that is when you look back, he's building all these amazing properties to what? Enhance the property value, to add value. He's basically so unimaginative that he has to copy the Mormon playbook. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of what CST and and a lot of even now their plan is is to take all the areas, any space that LRH ever wrote anything and make it a museum or make it a place oh, that people right. can come by and be like, Oh my God, he wrote the way to infinity here. Wrote route to infinity was here, you know? And make it a so museum nobody's going to visit. Well, and it's also making jobs for people that don't need a job anymore. Hmm. So like it, once you finish your archival part, like it's just maintenance or you can create new jobs or. Yeah, so yeah, maybe they'll make them go back and do them in different languages and put vaults in every country. Who knows? So then are these vaults locked up or because what if, you know, there's the apocalypse, right? Do you run and unlock the vault so people can get in? Like how yeah, right before? Run! Yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I would imagine. But then everything would burn up, right? Like, so it's, an, it's kind of a catch-22. Yeah, because um, how do you get into the vault because there... Well, I'm, asha I'm ashamed to say that I have no idea, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. Um yeah I, it never came up i never asked you know <laughs> it's kind of one of those built i remember the vault doors they were huge three feet thick like i mean steel they were full on um but yeah never even thought of like i, I imagine the code's like eight zero zero eight or something right <laughs> like that's what i kind of figure it's <laughs> well, there like, is an actual code then that somebody would need to enter no it's all it has to it has to it has a locking mechanism absolutely you can't have them open like that because then that would that would devalue the in the archival process even though they're all in you still have to have that area treated until you can't right so yeah you know air scrubbers that kind of thing um so yeah i don't that, that was never you know even though new mexico was done um petrolia was the only vault that wasn't done that i i wasn't in um yeah. but yeah, I never, it never really, and it's, it is, it's probably one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, the code is password. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Password is Hubbard. <laughs> right, exactly. Hubbard, Hubbard rules. Wow. Um, Let yeah, me ask it's, you. It's, it's pretty much, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just like so fascinated. I have so many questions and I just want to answer a question for the chat. If you go to my channel, there's a button that says join. You can click on that. You can also go to the description of this video. Actually, I don't know if I put it in there now that I'm thinking about it. But on my channel, there's a join button. And that is how that's how you join. Because people were asking in the chat where that was. Oh, so cool. yeah. 
these vaults, they're there, the materials there are VIPs or like, cause I was running cause Tom Cruise and David Miscavige are so tight. Would he be given a tour or allowed to see it? Or is even it off limits to him? Um, the short answer is it's absolutely off limits. Um, I remember when this, okay, this is kind of one of the things that got me speaking up again. in like, um, when anonymous came out, yeah. Uh, Tony Ortega had done some sensationalistic pieces on it. And um, at the time, you know, I think part of being and growing up in Scientology is you're very analytical <laughs> mm-hmm. and you're, you're kind of, you know, when you process stuff, it's like, you're kind of right here right now. And matter of fact, um, which isn't a bad trait, but it can be very annoying. And I know that I possess this trait. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I think that, um, I don't even, I don't, I, I totally lost my train of thought. I was saying. Like, I got carried away. Sorry. You know what's uh, funny? Ever since you mentioned you were talking about Chinese school and how we used to drill these, these LRH datums and stuff. And ever since then, it's just been running in the background in my head. The ones like that we, like, I totally remember we would do the affluence detainment. Mm-hmm. Remember? Affluence. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> I Hard work, ethic, standard tech, doing the things <laughs> at one, not new things untried as yet. Uh, Applying the formula of the condition one is in. Is in that's right. That <laughs> I cannot awesome. tell you what I had for breakfast, but I remember that. <laughs> no, right? I tried to. We only did like messenger orders, and usually, so it's even. I did an interview um before everything got really crappy with Claire, and she had her little Chinese school things that they all did, and I was like, yeah. huh. We never did that. We, didn't do those. <laughs> you know, we, we did a different Chinese school than that. Yeah, they were different. And that would make sense that they would vary by organization and what was needed. I know we would do the affluent attainment one or like uh, the uh, the degree of complexity is directly proportional to the degree of non-confront. Right, that was an right. LRH datum that we would get a lot because it's like if you're complicating something or it's complicated, it's because you're not confronting it. And exactly, was- right. Yeah, that all the time. I remember, I think we did that one at the Continental Liaison. Be willing to confront anything. You know, and it's funny too, we should, I know we were, we had planned to talk about um, our daily life in the Sea Org. Yeah. Um, And we should definitely talk about that sometimes because. Oh no, we're doing that. Yeah, that'll be a whole separate one. That's definitely like the day in the life of different echelons of the of the sea org is actually quite interesting yeah because um, we different. had missionary units like we would fi- i would fire myself on missions you know at three in the morning if i mm-hmm. couldn't recruit somebody i had to go on it myself that was part of the policy so wow. we would do i did probably 50 to 60 missions in the sea org wow and, that's a lot i don't think i ever did a mission beyond oh well you know what i did recruitment missions for the sea org a couple times mm-hmm. but i don't know that it was an actual mission i think it was a tour because to do a mission right. you got to do the whole uniform you got to do the whole routing that class a to- lanyard yeah, it was yeah i never did any of that i think it was just a recruitment tour that i went on with somebody and 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 did that so and those were done through i think div six a lot of the time um yeah because they were for that promotional marketing yeah i think so so when you're up there and these so these vaults right now are there they exist mm-hmm. on these different bases and they're full of l ron hubbard's technology and ways to consume that technology there's solar there's plug-in they're even crank things for the machines so when David Miscavige came out and said, hey, we found all these errors in these books for Ellen Hubbard, so you all have to buy them all over again. Did that affect what was on the the, the nickel and the parchment or whatever it was? Did Well, and that's, yeah, it did the, that whole um, golden age of tech. Yeah. So there was like, like the first, and then you would remember the very first like kind of golden age of tech when, um, like success through communication and self analysis, like all the intro courses came out. Yeah. The beginning uh, before that, it was like Hubbard Academy courses. Like it was kind of billeted as almost like a junior college or, and that's what they were called was Hubbard colleges and, yeah. and, and stuff like that. So 
So even as a kid, there weren't, you were doing like adult courses, even the student hat was student hat, you know, hard to do. I think you're muted, Dylan. Oh, there you Hold are. On. Now you're back. Now you're back. Can you hear me? Last time your mic went out, you couldn't, you, you could not hear me. I did that it is- again. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, Kelly Mills is <laughs> Don't touch anything. <laughs> yeah, don't touch anything. How many There's vaults? Four vaults. Four vaults. Okay. I'm just going to grab just a couple questions here. Um, and say Lorraine, hip, hip, hooray. Thank you for becoming a member on the channel. I appreciate that Pretty support. Down, Lorraine. Uh, Demarkey D, is Big Blue haunted? The Big Blue uh, buildings. The basement is pretty sketchy. Mm-hmm. I lived in Lebanon Hall when I was there. Yeah, me too. What floor did you live on? Fourth floor. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if I lived on the fourth. I was four the- north for um, what pointing towards. Um, the observatory oh okay I, was on that yeah. side. I don't think i was on that side so see. remember how they had their the all the bathrooms were at the end of the hall mm-hmm. yeah i hated Unless that you're you like room. trying to get out there for a shower <laughs> <laughs> had to go in your towel no one gave you a right. robe <laughs> i know so the only reason why i stayed in love hall was because my um 2d at the time was up at csp yeah and we were in 2D birthing, so yeah, That's where they put all the super high execs. <laughs> I was in Lebanon Hall, but I wasn't an exec at all. I was bottom of the barrel. Were you just married? I was married to another bottom of the barrel. I was huh. keeping a low profile because I knew I knew my mouth would get me in trouble. So I'm like, I better get right. to the estate org. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't trying to do that. So these bases are there. No one's allowed to see them except the people who are there. There's a couple at each base who are caretakers and keep an eye on things and go in and clean and do inventory. Like you're saying, keep an eye mm-hmm. on Ellen Hubbard's house, but this isn't something that even Sea Org members are allowed to tour. Now, is Are you aware of any plan to add more of these bases? Um, and there was and that's where wyoming came in and then there was talk about south africa Mm -hmm. um but i don't know what happened because honestly the way that the bases were funded were through sea org reserve number one and asi and sea org reserve number one is basically all the income from all of scientology is brought up through the continental liaison office international and then that's brought over through the um, Int Management Office or the Int Finance Police, basically. Yeah. Um, and all that is then funneled through this account called Sea Org Reserves, or SO number one is what it is. Um, and that was the main one of our main accounts that we built most of our vaults from. Well, if you look at the way Scientology's kind of gone, um, the income is dropped down. So, you know, somebody who appears to be like a David Miscavige type figure who is doing something that it gets him like negative fuel because it's not admiration for him. It's admiration for his quote unquote Messiah, which Mm -hmm. is pretty obvious that he's kind of past that. And he wants to attain, you know, I'm sure there's a, when he goes to bed is like the, how much I've done for this organization, you know, how ungrateful. Um, I think that plays in a lot to why there's no more vaults <laughs> <That makes, laughs> because that doesn't preserve David Miscavige that preserves LRH. They'll probably make and, his vault. Well, and what they do SMP, that's, What's that's SMP? his Scientology media productions. That's like David Miscavige's little baby. So now they're putting all this money into So these are like things, tangible things that you can touch that only David, like the whole ideal org program. That's not policy. There's no freaking policy about that. All yeah, of it is making the org St. Hill size yeah, by point exactly. four xing the stats. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, why so many people left and had that upset because that wasn't right. the LRH policy to build these organizations. Nancy says, this is so creepy. If someone finds this stuff in a thousand years, they will think we're all crazy. Can you <laughs> right. imagine? Let's even say, let's paint a picture, right? Let's say there's apocalypse and everybody's gone and one day, Maybe some aliens show up and they're like, oh, let's go check this out. And they go in this vault and they're going through the Scientology materials because they're like, 
this must be really important because it was preserved and they get to the Xenu stuff and they read it and they're like, that didn't happen. <laughs> right. Or, or the fact that English will probably be obsolete by then. Like, yeah, why exactly. wouldn't they put it in like a high, like in an, a more internationally acceptable language, Yeah, you know, or a few like those kind of things. And, and it's that whole idea of like, when you're in it, you don't question, yeah. you do it, you know, and if you don't do it, you're counter intention. So yeah. you do it and you do, later you start unraveling things. Like I, I remember when I realized it, I'm like, how are they going to get in the vault? <laughs> like, I was just like, whoa, you know, like it was one of those moments where you're just like, wow, I really, that's what, that's what corrosive, you know, persuasion is. That, yeah. That's really what it is. It is irrelevant panda. So once complete, does each vault get sealed forever or does a three foot thick door get opened on occasion to inspect or whatever? Yeah. And the yes and no, <laughs> it's supposed to be kind of closed forever, but there are certain vaults that have personal effects that would be inventoried. So there would be vaults that would be open and they're all capable of being opened. And to your point, maybe having some materials swapped out when they find a few more commas or semicolons in the wrong place kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Cause you would think they would go through and need to be able to do that. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's accessible. It's all it's they're not, there would be nothing that would be, it's not like you put a little wax seal on it and then you're like, wait, that's yeah. broken. You know, so. <laughs> with the, uh, the vault in Wyoming was never completed because they never pulled permits for construction. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. They started just working and they, they helicoptered because it was such a hard terrain. They actually helicoptered, um, uh, containers in full of all the materials and equipment and stuff and just put up lights and started working, got no permits. <laughs> like everybody's just like, Nope, this ain't happening in Wyoming. And it didn't yeah. <laughs> good on them. <laughs> Not happening in Wyoming or Montana. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> are these empty Hubbard houses properties justified as being used under some religious clause in regards to property taxes, or could the tax man come collect like in New Haven, Connecticut? So that is one of the reasons why it was kept secret for so long is uh, that CST was denied their tax exemption. And when, when Scientology got their tax exemption, CST was denied. Um, and then they had to do a few more things and threaten a few more people and maybe, you know, snuff a cat or two. Um, <laughs> I mean that in the best way. Um, I like cats, <laughs> um, but they had to do that. And then finally they got their, their tax exemption. And then there's a video shortly after that, where DM, um, addresses the ship people about the progress and he calls it cst and and the reason why he's able to do that is because it's an independent um religious organization tax exempt now so wow sarah says wow i wonder if like easter morning someday people will come looking for survivors of a nuclear holocaust and instead they find these empty bunkers filled with meaningless dribble <laughs> right well and it but has a shelf life you know that's the thing is the english language will have it if there's an apocalypse it providing people that speak English survive, there's the possibility they might be able to interpret it. But if they don't, it, it's kind of all for naught. Yeah, it so. seems like an idea. Do you have any idea how much money each one of these bases take, or maybe an idea of what it takes financially to build one of these vaults with the materials and everything? Are basically about 22 million um, in 1980s, 90s money. Wow. So, um, our production building was right around 14 million at the time. Um, That's crazy because that really shows you how much that at the upper levels of Scientology and international management after Ellen Hubbard was gone, David Miscavige, whoever believed so much that Ellen Hubbard was coming back and that this technology needed to be preserved, that they would put that much money in the 80s, $22 million at each one of these. That is an incredible amount of money for a bunch of stuff to just sit there. Well, and they're doing like, it, even in the in the late 80s, they were doing microwave technology. They were putting fiber optics in conduits at the time, which 
um, any techies out there would know that that's very early for fiber optics. Um, and they were part of that was to have like, I'm sure it's there now, but was to have a, a, a line between int and CST and <clears throat> possibly ASI yeah, where you have direct communication that can, can't be like sabotaged or infiltrated or anything like that. So they've been, we did, we did glycol heated stamped concrete pathways all through the Lake Arrowhead, like five miles of pathways that would heat up. No, like just walkways, like out between all the buildings and, you know, in winter it would turn on and it would warm up before the snow fell and it would melt. So all the pathways would stay dry. It's just money to spend money. It's I'm telling I honestly, he copied the Mormon. Mm. Like, the original dm geez man joseph smith come on you cannot know. be original <laughs> gg to three the doors to open these vaults are right at level surface or how do how do we get down into the vault sounds like so every, there she, this, does she like book a ticket yeah, over? yeah she's ready she wants to get to that vault door um there will be a building that is usually it was a vent building that we called it um but it's like a staging building that is in front so you don't just have like a vault sticking out of like yeah. the earth or so it's like a building to kind of mask it. So you go down and there's a little elevator door and it, you know, well, like you said, there's, a, there's a guard house or area right to each of these, but it sounds like a lot of them are, or a few might be in the middle of nowhere or are they completely fenced off? They're all in the middle of nowhere. They're all fenced and they're all like, there's nothing in proximity to. So like the vault in New Mexico yeah. is, a good distance away from the LRH house, which is a good distance away from the caretaker's house, which, so it's the same in Petrola. I think the, the yeah. vault in Petrolia is like four, three or four miles from the caretaker house. Wow. And you have to go through the caretaker house to get to the vault site. Oh, wow. Yeah. What, what about, um, oh, I totally just lost my train of thought. I keep forgetting this one question <laughs> with the, with the way that the vaults are designed, right? There's, and if you covered all of L. Ron Hubbard's materials and there's no need to add other things into it, you just might have to update it potentially depending on what, what comes up, right? Cause the, David Miscavige redid the books, redid so many things. They may, they may or may not be updating them. Cause you said they, they worked off original L. Ron Hubbard writings. And, well, and that, even at the time, that's what to me seemed like if there was any weird stuff going on like squirreling of the tech yeah we would have found it <clears throat> and yeah, so it's what a lot of the stuff that didn't it was a lot of questions on like what ouds would go in which is like orders of the day or what flag orders uh or what ship orders or what and it was very much lrh legitimately written word like a lot of the um like all the commodore's messenger orders were written for LRH, not by LRH. So it was authorized and approved by and written yeah. for. So there was a lot of, you know, like approval needed on what does and what doesn't get archived. Yeah. Um, so. I, had heard, I had heard, I thought before that there were some kind of uh, like crop circles or something pointing to oh. these places. Is there any yeah. truth to that? And if so what is that about? So when I did, I did an interview with, Tony Ortega like six or seven years ago I want to say and he was just he was all hell-bent on having the meaning be like it's for LRH to find his way back and it's like that just doesn't make any sense right um the the CST logo itself is it, it's almost that little hint into like LRH's kind of dark magic background yeah kind of like the way the um they're not diamonds they're a they're ARC and KRC triangles with what is like what above is below kind of okay. concept, like Rosicrucian kind of concept. And then the, the um, infinity logo is not really an infinity logo because it's elongated mm -hmm. and, and it has a different meaning. So, um, those so there was are out there that you can see from up in the sky or from space. Right. And, and the idea is that there was an ancient knowledge or idea behind it that would attract um beings or thetans or spirits or souls or whatever to that to those locations um not it's 
and maybe it was based i mean and this is the weird thing about scientology is like you can if i give you my experience as i experienced it i was a true believer when it happened i grew up in it my grandfather you know like i i have this lineage that to me it was all of course don't look yeah. at the newspaper yeah. when ot3 is there or you will die and yeah. you don't you know that that was like palatable fear like i was afraid to and i could i remember seeing it on the coffee table going like oh my god that's you know you'll die <laughs> and yeah. so it's that um when you look at it from that perspective um or you can look at it from the perspective of having lived it and now looking back saying of course it was all bullshit yeah um, so but at the time like that that's a lot of i think when we tell our a lot of us tell our stories is you know i'm kind of to a point where i like to look back at it as i experienced it yeah and yeah. and look back and be like wow these are some of the things that happened and why i am the way i am now um and of course it makes sense now but when you're in that corrosive persuasion yeah. it, it it's harder to decipher because you've already had all your good stuff corroded away and now all this stuff has been put in yeah. its place so. being out there in the middle of nowhere with these and for lack of a better word crop circles so that, like you said, the, they're, that are created, the infinity symbol, are, are these at each of the bases so that from space or from up above, like you said, they were created so that beings would be drawn into that area? They are. Um, and even the Creston Ranch was given to CST. Um, and that's where LRH passed away. That was the horse ranch yeah. in Creston, California. Uh, and there's no vault at that site at least there's no like storage facility there is a personal vault there um, and that could be the other place that um stuff would be stored although i think security wise um, i remember hearing a story about pat broker um trying to dig up a vault at that place that had a bunch of stuff but i don't know the the validity behind it that's true um, cc's asking did you ever see any ufos around any of these in, in Trementina, there's that. I mean, like where I live now, it's crazy. Like the saddle, I I am out in the middle of nowhere. Like I have no light pollution at all where I'm at. Wow. So it's quite same with there. So I not per se like not like you know um that kind of experience, but there was definitely a vast ex expansion when you're out there. Yeah. Oh, it's just fascinating, Dylan. We're going to do a few of these. I'm sure we'll do multiple videos because we want to do one specifically about kind of a day in the life of a Sea Org member. What does that look like? And what does it look like at the different levels? So we right. are going to do that again. I thank you so much for doing this and sharing about it. And everybody keep your questions coming because if not, you know, in the comments, if you're catching this on the replay, you can head over to Dylan's channel, Blow Drill, right here. Go subscribe. He's got other videos you were saying on there too, right? Where you share. I do. Something. Yes. Yeah. I got a few. Uh, my shorts. If you look at right these, there. the shorts. Yeah. Those are the, the C. I uh, know it's up, go up a little bit. I think maybe they're not sure. Yeah. That one. So okay. all those are like one and two minute little, and they go, some of them go over CST and so they'll give you some pictures of the vaults or, and the, um, the containers and junk like that. And cool. Just some, Awesome. So everybody get over there and subscribe if you don't already. We will do another video. Absolutely. I think we're going to do a bunch of them and kind of really get into pull the curtain back on some of the day to day things about the Sea Org because I know I get a lot of questions about that as well. So thank you. Absolutely. So you know, I think that would be amazing. That would be fun. Yeah, I agree. Pause for Andrea. It's so interesting for sure. So everybody, you know the drill, hit that like button, make sure you subscribe, subscribe to both our channels, check your subscribe button. Dylan, hold on for just a sec. I'm going to talk to you offline. <laughs> everybody right. else Thanks, tomorrow. Guys. Yes. And thank you for being here. Tomorrow, I'm going to do the roundup with Scientology News at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. Usually I do it at 8 a.m., but tomorrow I have to do it at 8.30 if you're watching this on March 13th. I should say that. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great rest of the evening. And most importantly, get out there and have the most amazing cult-free day.